Hello, hello. Hi, hi, hi. And welcome back to a Beatles podcast show called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about whatever we feel like when it comes to the Beatles, their history, their music, what happened in the past, the group years, the solo years, what's going on today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you're familiar with my radio program that I've been doing for 41 years now uh, called Every Little Thing, heard on over 50 radio stations around the world. And I also co-host another Beatles podcast show called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's another bi-weekly show that's on YouTube and all the audio platforms. And I also have my own YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, which is all loaded with Beatles content, interviews with people like musicians, authors, uh, DJs, podcasters, you name it. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts on this show, a man who's known for his many years writing in the classical department at the New York Times. These days, he's a freelancer for the Wall Street Journal and other publications. And he's also the author of several Beatle books, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, uh, Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. We should do an in-depth show about that song in particular since that anniversary is coming up very soon but uh most recently he's known for being one of two authors along with adrian sinclair for the mccartney legacy volume one that he's pointing to right behind him which covers the time when the beatles broke up through the end of 1973 when paul was going to really explode with ben on the run and that is our very own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. And Darren, everyone out in Radioland, <laughs> podcast land, whatever it is, land. YouTube land. <laughs> and also we have Darren DeVivo, who has been a mainstay in New York radio at uh, WFUV, Fordham University Station, for nearly 40 years. And... Um, does fantastic interviews there, does a lot of great shows where he plays rock, new rock, some classic rock, and he does occasional Beatles specials on there too. And uh, welcome back, Darren. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> uh, he wouldn't do the show without you. If, if, after every show, I think, gee, is this going to be the one where they then say, you know what, Darren, don't come back. But no, it's great to great to be here uh, after our two Mark Rivera show, Ringo Starr shows. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> I wouldn't think of doing the show without you. So, uh, yes, we're back. We have a new show to do right now. And uh, we thought it's a simple idea. And I know we're not the only ones that have done this. We take all the British Beatles albums and we name what is our favorite and least favorite song from each album. Which is not easy to pull off if you like just about everything that the Beatles have done. But hopefully, in this incredible canon that they gave us, you'd be able to pick out what you think is your favorite and uh, which one you like the least. And by the way, before we even start doing that, there is a distinction between what you feel is the best and what you think is your favorite. Mm -hmm. They're two completely different things. Okay, we're just talking about what, what our favorites for us right, right now. Right. And um, that can always change, which is what art is all about, our opinions about them through time. Before we do that, we have quite a lot of Beatle news to get to. And we'll start with uh, the official news that Paul McCartney will be back on the road with his Got Back Tour with what is now seven dates in Australia, beginning on October the 18th in Adelaide, ending November 4th in Gold Coast, where along with Newcastle, he'll be playing for the first time. A second show was just added in Sydney. There was a long period from 1993 to 2017 when Paul didn't play Australia at all. And Paul returned to play a series of dates in November and December of 2017. Now, in addition to that, it just so happens that on today, and we're recording this August 7th, it was announced that Paul's doing five dates in Brazil. 
and that will start November 30th and end December 16th. What's kind of interesting here, and um, you know, Darren was emailing me this, uh, is that there's a lot of gaps here, mm -hmm. long periods of rest in between the shows for Paul in Brazil. And unless he adds dates in between Australia and Brazil, you've got November 4th, the last show in Australia, to, to uh, November 30th. So um, there, there's time for him to fit in shows in between, but we'll have to wait and see if he takes a rest um, in between. Paul's last full concert appearance was when he headlined the Glastonbury Festival last year. Pretty remarkable, 81 years old. It's going to be interesting to see when this uh, tour kicks off what the set list will be. Will it be the exact same set list that he's been doing um, on the Got Back Tour? Will it be two and a half hours to three hours? Will he cut back? Who knows? But um, the whole thing starts in Australia on October the 18th. All right. A very important person in Paul's career has passed away. Mm -hmm. That being composer and conductor Carl Davis. Carl was born in Brooklyn, New York, and wound up living in England. He wrote music for more than 100 television programs, including the BBC's Pride and Prejudice in 1995. He created new scores for concert and cinema performances of vintage silent movies. And he also wrote many film, ballet, and concert scores that were performed worldwide. And he's best known to Paul's fans and Beatle fans for collaborating with Paul for his Liverpool Oratorio in 1991. This was an eight movement choral work that McCartney and Davis wrote together with Davis conducting. It proved to be highly successful, reaching number one on the classical charts in Billboard. And um, not only that, but in uh, 2016, Paul recorded a song called In the Blink of an Eye for an animated film called Ethel and Ernest. Now, the film included a soundtrack album and Carl composed an original score for it. Plus, he worked on many of the instruments and string arrangements for In the Blink of an Eye. The soundtrack also features Carl Davis's recording of an instrumental song that was originally written by Paul's father, Jim, walking in the park with Eloise. Paul recorded it in Nashville in 1974 with his band Wings under the name The Country Hams. The new cover of that song was credited with Carl Davis as the artist, and it was made the B-side for Paul's vinyl single of In the Blink of an Eye. That vinyl single was just included in the new McCartney singles box set. So Carl continued his association with Paul not that long ago. Sadly, uh, Davis died of a brain hemorrhage on August the 3rd, and he was 86. And Paul himself just issued a statement online. He said, I was very sad to hear that my friend Carl Davis had passed away. Carl and I wrote the Liverpool Oratorio together. It was my first full-length classical venture, and I really enjoyed working with him to make it happen. I would show up at his house, and we would start writing. I would suggest an idea, and he would write it down on the manuscript paper, which made it easy for him to play the idea back to me, and we progressed like that. He was a very skillful and fun man to be with. His enthusiasm was extremely infectious, and we had a great time during the period that we worked together. When we came to perform the piece at Liverpool Cathedral, it was very exciting for me, who had once failed an audition for the choir at the cathedral, to be back there with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and tremendous soloist Dame Kiri Kanawa, uh, Sir Willard White, Sally Burgess, Jerry Hadley, and a large choir for a very special evening. I enjoyed my time with Carl very much and send my love and sympathies to his lovely wife, Jean, and their daughters, Hannah and Jesse. Love, Paul. Very sad to hear. I've always enjoyed the oratorio. Um, guys, you want to say anything about this? Well, I was at that premiere. And, um, you know, I, I, I really liked the work at the time i still do um i've i've heard it relatively recently um and it to me it stands up i mean it's uh you know, a lot of my classical colleagues 
didn't like it very much. Um, I think there's just a lot of suspicion of a pop guy writing a classical piece. But um, the thing is that, that, you know, these movements are really just extended song forms. And McCartney can write a song for him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, they they really were quite melodic. There was a, a, a long violin solo in it, which uh, made me feel like, you know, he could be a really good concerto composer if he if he went in that direction. Um, but I enjoyed it. And um, I heard it again when it was done at Carnegie Hall. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the recording is out there for people to hear and uh and and i think people should um you know spare spare the 90 minutes or so that it takes to uh to hear it and give it a spin yeah i think all of his classical works are worthy of uh, a re-examination but um i've always loved the oratorio because as soon as you hear it, it it sounds like mccartney i mean there are certain melodies that you just know sound like something he would write yeah and then there, some of them are just absolutely beautiful, like Save the Child, for example. Oh. But um, yeah, and the singing is tremendous and just love the whole thing and just admire him for going so much further than just writing a pop song with a classical arrangement. To do a full-blown one takes a lot of work. And he continued to do that with Standing Stone and you know other works, the ballet, Ocean's Kingdom. Eke Cormeum, the, the uh, one he wrote for Linda. And he has a, a bunch of um, shorter pieces, not all of which have been recorded. Um, but uh, I think when Standing Stone was done at Carnegie Hall, uh, the first half of the program was devoted to those, and I accidentally recorded them. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so they're floating around out there. Well, we, you know, we hope that a lot of this unreleased stuff will, will come out eventually. We were talking about that um, on on my channel uh, with Luca Parasi, what we'd like to see from McCartney and the, yeah, the guitar um, Spinel, uh, classical guitarist. There was a, a piece that, that Paul wrote, which still hasn't been released yet. There's a whole bunch of other things that we've heard about, stately horn, a horn piece uh, that's never been officially released. Um, and some things, more interesting pieces from him came out on Working Classical as well. Then there's a leaf, <laughs> you know, the whole piano piece there. Anyway, I digress. Um, did you want to say anything about this, Darren? No, I just, and I, always, I, I enjoyed all of Paul's, but I don't pretend to have really a classical ear. Uh, I, I enjoyed all of his classical pieces, Um I think Liverpool Oratorio was a special one because it was the first one, and it was, it was the uh, the novelty of McCartney branching out into <clears throat> into this direction. I remember being very uh, at the time very tuned into it when it was on PBS. Mm. It was um, I'm trying to remember now. There was documentaries, which I'm assuming was PBS uh, upon the album's release. Um, and I knew that Carl Davis was was like the the guy that Paul, you know, uh, needed to kind of like bridge that gap between the pop and classical world for him, uh, and and was sad to hear of his passing. Uh, but uh, you know, it's been a long time, many years since I've played the Oratorio. Maybe I'll I should actually pull it out maybe this week. Um, but <clears throat> you know. Um, Another thing Carl Davis did, by the way, um, that people might enjoy if they can find them is um, he did scores for a lot of those silent classic uh, comedy things, like, you know, Buster Keaton films, things like that. Um, and those have been released commercially. And, you know, you just see his, he gets a little, you know, small type credit on the back. But if you, you know, if, if you're aware of Carl Davis and you see it, it's, it's like, oh, yeah, him. So um, and those are pretty, pretty fun, too. So just another thing if if people run into them yeah he had his hand in a lot of work yep you know there's a lot there to explore if you care to um also paul mccartney was spotted with steven spielberg outside a movie theater in the hamptons as they attended a showing of the new film oppenheimer in rolling stone paul referenced spielberg who he said he met in 1986 seeking advice from him 
I'm making a movie about the Beatles. PCGamer.com reports that while we recall that in 2015, Paul composed music for the video game Destiny made by the group Bungie, along with the single Hope for the Future, Paul composed several tracks and motifs that shaped the original Destiny soundtrack, with credits on five of the eight tracks and other credits on the full original soundtrack. Well, Bungie composer Ella Feingold has posted a tease on her Instagram account of a score sheet with the name P. McCartney on it. While it's unlikely that Paul has composed new music for the company, it hints that Bungie's audio team may revisit some of Paul's earlier compositions that haven't been heard since The First Destiny. We will know when the run-up to The Final Shape comes out, due in early 2024. It is trailed by Bungie as the conclusion to the long-running Light and Darkness saga. All right. On July 18th, bass player Nathan East posted a photo of him with Ringo in which he said, working on new music with Ringo this week. Always a joy. Peace and love. So we do know from what Ringo has said that he plans on releasing three EPs. One, the first one, he said is already in the can. And he said that he would record the second one in between the two tours with the All-Star Band. So that's what he's working on now. When he's finished with the All-Star Band, uh, the next tour, then he's going to work on the third EP. The All-Star Band resumes touring in the U.S. on September the 15th, and that runs through October 13th. A new book comes out September 7th called Shake It Up Baby. The Rise of Beatlemania and the Mayhem of 1963 by our good friend Ken McNabb, who's best known for his book, And in the End, The Last Days of the Beatles. It's all about the remarkable year when the Beatles broke out in England, a real roller coaster ride filled with recording sessions, almost 300 concerts, BBC radio and TV appearances when they were transformed into the biggest success story of the year in their native country. Okay, and we did interview Ken several years ago when uh, and in the end was released you might want to check that out on our uh, audio platforms and on youtube the chicago fest for beetle fans takes place this coming weekend august 11th through the 13th at the hyatt regency o'hare in chicago special guests include greg bissonette jay bergen patty boyd billy j kramer joey mullen terry sylvester ken womack and our very own alan cozen if you ever notice why the price of the tickets went up, it's mainly because Alan's included. It's Alan, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you can go to thefest.com for more information on that. So if you want to meet Alan in person. I'll be there. He will be there this coming weekend. Every if, you, if you want to meet Ken and I in person, you're right. out of luck. We're not going to be there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We'll be there in February. All right. Every year since John's passing, the group Theater Within have been doing tribute concerts for John. This year will be their 43rd show, and it will be headlined by Graham Nash, with other special guests, including Judy Collins, uh, Rita Coolidge, the Kennedys, Willie Nile, Roseanne Cash, and Mark Cohn. The show takes place December 2nd at Town Hall in New York City. For more information, you can go to their website, which is Lennon Tribute dot org a uh, couple of passings we need to mention here um the loss of singer actress and fashion icon jane birkin she's known for her personal and artistic relationship with songwriter serge gainsbourg and for her beatles connection we have three of them uh she played the main role in the film wonderwall of uh, the mm -hmm. very attractive model that lives next door to an eccentric scientist played by Jack McGowan, who is like a peeping Tom uh, looking for Jane through a hole in the wall between them. The 1968 movie had George Harrison do the film score and ironically, Jane Birkin's character's name um, happened to have been Penny Lane. That was her name in the film. George, Patty Boyd, Ringo and wife Maureen, and Jane Birkin were seen together at the Cannes Film Festival for Wonderwall. And you could actually see photos of that on YouTube. It's kind of like a slideshow in a way 
of uh, of all those people together at Cannes. Uh, but there's one other connection. Um, actually, no, there's two other connections. Yeah. Uh, she and husband Serge had a daughter, Charlotte, for whom Paul McCartney wrote a song and played piano, guitar, additional drums, and probable bass for the song Songbird in a Cage, released in 2017. And with special thanks to Ricardo Miguel, a listener from my Talk More Talk podcast, he told us that Jane released a nostalgic song in 1978 called X-Fan Day 60s, where she mentions all four of the Beatles in the song, which you can check out on YouTube if you like. We all heard about the passing of Sinead O'Connor at the very young age of 56. One of her songs from 1994 is called Famine, which dealt with the Great Famine and how it impacted Ireland. And she sings the lines of all the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where did they all belong? Taken, of course, from Eleanor Rigby. Another big shock of uh, major passing there in the music industry with Sinead O'Connor. Finally, we send out a very happy 80th birthday going out to Denny Sywell, who turned mm. on July the 10th, and also July 26th, Mick Jagger turned 80 as well. Okay, that's all the news we have for you this time. Plenty there, <laughs> packed from the last several weeks. So as we said earlier, our show this time, we're going to be just having some fun talking about what we feel are our favorite songs and least favorite songs from each of the Beatles' British albums from Please Please Me through Let It Be. And, um, you know, this this is not an easy thing to do because I've always said the Beatles catalog is so solid from start to finish. You know, I happen to like every song in the Beatles catalog. Of course, not all at the same level. We all have our favorites. We also have the ones that are at the bottom of the list. And I should also point out that when we talked about doing this, I said, well, you really can't count something like Her Majesty or Wild Honey Pie or Maggie May or even Revolution Number 9. You know, they're in a different category. They're not the, the real short ones. There are not complete songs. That's how I feel anyway. I would not put them in the same category as the others. Otherwise, it would be easy to say Abbey Road, Her Majesty, <laughs> you know, um, but I'm leaving it up to my my two co-hosts here. If they want to put those songs in there, there they can do so. Um, Revolution number nine, I look at as being an experimental piece. It's certainly not, you know, a pop rock song. Um, however, you want to categorize it. If you feel you want to put that in your in this um, category of favorite or least favorite, and don't laugh when I say favorite because I have a feeling it might be Alan's favorite from the White Album. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> give anything away but i know that you think really highly of revolution number nine so we're gonna go through all the albums in chronological order and find out and if you want to you know if you want to have a couple of favorites or a tie that's okay because you know these are yeah, yeah. solid you know and and may i just add that i'm sure that when i'm speaking for both of you when i say this if we did this show again on wednesday in two days mm -hmm. from now our picks would probably be different. Could be, you know, at least with some, in some cases with certain albums, I found a few cases where trying not to get run, it was almost impossible not to have runners up or honorable mentions, or this would be something that a week from now I would probably pick as my favorite. Um, so. Well, that's why I like to say opinions, opinions change over time. Right. And maybe songs that you didn't think that highly of early on in your life, and now you think they're brilliant. Or maybe vice versa. Maybe songs you don't like as much, or maybe songs that you're kind of burnt out on. There may be some Beatles songs that maybe you are, and some songs that you're discovering now and really appreciating much more now. So that's what I'm actually interested in seeing with the two of you pick in the least favorite category for the albums, because I found that on more than one occasion, my least favorites tended to be songs that I was a little tired of hearing, that I was burned out on, um, in on on in numerous cases. That was that was the you know situation with me. So I'm interested to see. 
And also, you know, there's one thing that's kind of important to mention here, and that is that the songs that are played the most tend to be the hits, the hit singles. Mm -hmm. Beatles prided themselves, in most cases, with making sure their singles in the UK weren't on their albums, with the exception of the, the, the movie albums, A Hard Day's Night and Help. You know, so there's a good chance that if there's a single that maybe you're tired of hearing, they're not on these albums. <laughs> so we didn't do past masters. We should. Right. Right. We'll save that for another time. Yeah. So let's start with Please Please Me. And Alan, why don't you give us your choices? Favorite and then least favorite. Okay. Um, favorite. Uh, you know, if I go by um, whatever, you know, when I've made mixtapes, <laughs> what I've put on, um, you know, I, I, I tend to think of I Saw Her Standing There as my favorite on that album. But looking at the track listing today, um, I kind of thought I wanted to switch that to Please Please Me itself, just because it's so energetic and fresh and, you know, that, that it just doesn't get old, you know, so there, it's... Um, their second single but it's uh it, it really kind of huge leap beyond love me do from my point of view and uh so i'm gonna go with that um because of its energy and it's uh you know the those 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 chords in between the lines and all that there's just a lot of nice little details in that song mm. that i really like um and my le my least favorite I'm going to go with Ask Me Why, the B-side. <laughs> um, hadn't thought of that. Um, <clears throat> just because um, to me, it sounds, I mean, you know, uh, like you had said, there there aren't any Beatles songs I don't like. Um, you know, just stipulating that, you know, as, as I often say on here, they're the zenith of Western Civ. And I'm mostly not joking when I say that. Um, but ask me why strikes me as, you know, it's got that sort of, you know, slightly kind of Latin bead and it, it just seems to me a little old fashioned for what they were doing. It seems that ask me why was the kind of song that they were overthrowing with things like, please, please me. Um, so I'm just thinking if, okay, if, if I had to listen to only 13 cuts on Please Please Me, I might skip Ask Me Why. And Alan, what was your favorite again? Which is the one you went with? I think I went with Please Please Me. Right, right. In it's 10 minutes, it might change back to a uh, sort of standing there. <laughs> Whatever. It's interesting that you said Please Please Me, because I remember in one of our shows, Darren said that when he hears Please Please Me, he thinks oldies. You know, and yet you you're saying that it sounds so fresh. Yeah. Well, we have different different opinions here, I guess. Well, that's what keeps the show going. Yeah. <laughs> we all agreed on the same thing. And, and, and are so. you sure I said that about please please me? Yes. Because yes. now I hear that and I'm going, really, Darren? You think that? Mm -hmm. Why? Yes, I do. Well, <laughs> aren't you just something wrong with you? No, because uh, now, like, I'm hearing that, I'm like, no, I don't necessarily agree with that. I kind of hear. What Alan hears, it's fresh. It's okay. I just remember what you said back then, because you know that upon occasion, the whole idea of whether or not certain music sounds dated really irritates me. I know. <laughs> whenever, whenever it's an issue, and yeah. I think on one occasion there, you brought up "Please Please Me." That it, yeah. It, all right. Okay. He's hmm. making it up. I don't <laughs> say that. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. All right. What are your choices, Darren? All right. Well, um, for my favorite track on on that album, um, I, I I picked I saw her standing there because to me that was like you know that is that 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 first boom there it is and here they are they are the Beatles and um, even even right down to like like McCartney's bass playing this is the beginning. This is the start for the most part. And and you hear, listen to what McCartney's playing at this point already. Uh -huh. It's almost like a sign of what this band was going to do, that they jumped out of the gate with their very first album. And, uh, and, and here's, you know, this, this gem of a, what, you know, maybe I overuse this phrase, this power pop gem. Mm -hmm. you know, 
and this was at the beginning. Um, for my least favorite, it's actually what you said I said about Please Please Me years ago. My least favorite, I picked Love Me Do, which um, to me, Love Me Do sounds like a, a young band with loads of talent writing their own song, and it's a good song, but it lumbers a bit, and it did, doesn't hold up as well all these years later. That would be something that I could be accused of saying, you know, that sounds a little old. It doesn't have, it doesn't hold up against the other, you know, masterpieces that this band came up with. But in 63, hmm. pop bands weren't writing their own material and coming up with something catchy like Love Me Do. But uh, as I often say, when we do things like this, something has to sink to the bottom. And for me, Love Me Do is was never a song that got me particularly excited. Um, so, so that's, you know, this was an album, Please Please Me is an album where I have a lot of songs I like a lot, uh, but only a couple of them. And really, I saw her standing there, rose to the top. It was a, kind of an easy one for me and Love Me Do down at the bottom. So that's that's the Please Please Me picks of mine. Okay. Very good. Um, as far as my picks, I think you'll be in shock as for what my favorite is. Um, I've always had a soft spot for Anna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good song. Tremendous song. You know, every now and then I've seen this quote from Paul where he said, we were a little R&B band. And growing up as a kid, I thought of them as pop rock. I didn't think R&B. But yeah, you listen to the vocals of of Anna and so much of the artists that they that they covered, the Motown artists and all, and certainly a little Richard and Chuck Berry and, and those artists too. And they had a great R&B feel and mixing that with great harmonies. And then the middle eight there um, is tremendous. There's a lot of development in the song. I love the fact that not only did they cover songs that were well known from the 50s but they did a lot of obscure stuff like arthur alexander's songs mm -hmm. and for a lot of people those obscure songs became known because the beatles did them and then people went and discovered the original versions but um anna you know i could say lennon's vocals carry the song <laughs> and, and they do in a way but what everybody else contributed made a huge difference um Great. Just hearing them answer back with the Anna. I just I always love that song. My least favorite would have to be a taste of honey. Um, I don't necessarily feel like hearing it when it does come on. But then again, you know, my least favorite Beatles songs I still like. I'd rather have them than not have. Yeah. Um, it's kind of corny, but then again, I'm not someone that minds corny songs. <laughs> and actually, um, Ask Me Why is one of my favorites, Alan, from the album, because it does have that Latin feel. It's kind of like their Besame Mucho, in a way, <laughs> if you want to think about it that way. It's a very unique song, and I don't know many pop bands that were doing that, mixing a little bit of Latin, that and that early on in their career. So um, those would be my picks, Anna and A Taste of Honey. All right. This time we'll start with you, Darren, for With the Beatles. Okay. All right. With the Beatles was hard. With the Beatles was hard to pick, like try to pick one that's a favorite. And this is a this is a a good album for me to say if we did this show again later in the week, mm. I might pick something different. But um, for very much, and, and, and excuse me while I'm looking over here, I've got my cheat sheet. I got the computer here just to refresh my memory about certain things. In much the same way, I pointed out that please, please me starts out with that punch that's i saw her standing there uh same thing for me with with the beatles and i went with the album opener as my favorite and uh that is it won't be long mm -hmm. um there's so many great songs on this album um are you going to hear us say that about just about every album yeah. but something about the way that starts out the album it won't be long you know with just vocals right in there um, so that ended up being my pick for my favorite. What I did find was I noticed that I don't know why this is. 
I'm, 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 I find myself often tired of a lot of the covers that they did. I don't know why. Hmm. Um, and as a result of that, the uh, album Closer, Money, That's What I Want, is my pick for my least favorite. Um, and for an original tune, in parentheses, the runner-up was Little Child, um, which to me was like, it's a again, I like it, but it's not one of the stronger songs, that the original songs that they came up with in mm. their early days. So my favorites, it won't be long. Let's go with money. That's what I want is my least favorite with honorable mention, a little child as my least favorite original on okay. that album. Yeah. You just got me thinking, Darren, one of the, one of the things that the Beatles did, one of the many things, the introductions were always so great. And there are certain songs where it just starts immediately with vocals, like it won't be long, you know, and it just sucks you in to the song, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, th there are certain songs that are just like that. Um, in fact, my choice and with the Beatles, which I'll get to after Alan does the same thing. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, Alan, what are your choices? Um. <clears throat> So for my favorite, it was All My Lovin'. Um, beautiful song, beautiful arrangement that they came up for with uh for it. Uh, you know, the the sort of tremolo guitar, you know, strumming and the um uh the bass line, you know, Darren mentioned the bass line for I saw her standing there, which is a great bass line. However, it's also the baseline for Chuck Berry's "I'm Talking About You," whereas "All My Lovin'" is totally original. You can't, I can't, I can't find it anyplace else. Um, and it has, it has that kind of walking, you know, boom, 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 boom. You know, that's a melody in itself. It's counterpoint, really. Um, so yeah, all my loving, uh, and my least favorite was Little Child. Um, Little Child just seems, uh, you know, in the context of the whole album, and you have to pick one as your least favorite. It, it just seemed maybe a little sort of commonplace. It does have a lot of energy. Um, it also, you know, I should go back to the Lewis and Sessions book and read about. The recording of it um because there were there's something strange about like when the piano solo in the middle um it just there's just some weird sound shift that goes on that has always sort of bothered me a bit and i bet when they get around to remixing that album that is going to get fixed it's going to be smooth all the way through and and that i think will really improve the song or perceptions of the song a bit um so those are my two okay well, I also had All My Lovin' as my favorite. Something about that song, uh, you know, as soon as you hear Paul start the vocals and it's right in your face, it just grabs you. Yeah. And that's, like I said, it's it's a great trick to have. And, you know, when you listen to the beginning of the song and it immediately gets your attention like that, and then it just sucks you in. Um can't buy me love is the same way when you start off with vocals like that you know goes right into uh well can't buy me love goes right into the chorus but and for all the reasons that alan mentioned that walking bass line which adds so much to it and um you know it was the the appropriate choice to um to be the first song on the ed sullivan show <laughs> you know it just gains your attention as soon as you hear it um, and also my least favorite is Little Child. I think it's kind of um, simplistic as a song, maybe too simple a song. But even still, it has a lot of energy and a lot of drive to it. And I still like it. And I love the harmonica solo in the middle. So like I said, even my the least favorite are songs that I still like. You know, I don't hate any of these songs by any means. You know, if if your least favorite is a song that you still like anyway, you're doing a great job. So you know, with all my love and um, there's like, just as another sort of personal thing, I mean, it, 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 it was one of those songs early on in the Beatles career that 
got adults interested in them. I mean, my parents really disliked the Beatles and they disliked them, I think, on principle because of the hair, because of this, because of that. But one day I was playing some of their stuff on my guitar from a songbook, you know, one of those songbooks that used to come out and was playing all my love in. And my mother came by and said, that's the Beatles. Well, that's really good. So, you know, it, it, it had that kind of appeal because the melody is so strong. You know, if you, you want to be against the Beatles for whatever reasons you sort of discover with all my love in that, you cannot sustain that argument musically. You can be against the hair if you want, although, you know, years and years later when she was, uh, you know, in Florida going to a garage sale and she got, uh, she found a copy of Meet the Beatles and she said, you know, the one with the picture of them in shadows with the really short hair. <laughs> I said, you didn't say that at the time. <laughs> But all my loving was like it. It just seemed to me that like that's the gateway drug for adults. I think it was. I think it was my mother's. Come to think of it, I think my mother liked that song a lot. Um, my cousin. I, I think it was my cousin gave me his copy of Meet the Beatles. Uh, it was pretty beat up, and I helped beat it up even more because I was so young. I'm probably like four years old. I seem to remember my mother gravitating to. All My Loving too. So probably when Ken says that it's the perfect song for them to open the Ed Sullivan show with, that's another reason, you know, that that appeal to everybody, that song. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a fun aspect to talk about with the Ed Sullivan show. How much thought was put behind the songs mm. that they performed? You know, it was very clever to put Till There Was You in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that also would appeal to older people who like show music, for example. So, uh, yeah. Um, I think for my mother, I don't remember if she liked All My Loving, but she loved And I Love Her. Mm. And I think um, yesterday was the, you know, the big change for a lot of people yeah. to just notice the Beatles then, the ones that the older generation that resisted them or thought that, you know, this was another pop group that wasn't going to last very long. Yeah. Um, anyway, so A Hard Day's Night. Alan, your picks. Okay. Um, you know, it was a hard one because with um, some of the others, you know, I, I went making mixtapes. I knew what I had chosen, but um, I'm not, you know, with Hard Day's Night, uh, I probably chose a Hard Day's Night and, you know, some of the, and, and, you know, and if I fell and then I love her and, you know, but I went this time with, I'm happy just to dance with you because, um, <laughs> excuse me. I like the song. I mean, it's not an amazing inventive song um, as, as, as many of theirs are, but it's, it's a good song for the time and for what it is and a, good vehicle for George. I like the way he sings it. Um, and it has a really kind of interesting chord progression. Um, and also the way the chords are played rhythmically. There's like a rhythmic thing going on under George singing the tune. Um, and it's just also one of those moments in A Hard Day's Night in the film that I really like, you know, when he steps up and, and starts singing it and, uh, and they're backing him. And it's, uh, so that was, you know, one that normally I might not have picked, but just sort of looking at the album, um, for the sake of this exercise, it just sort of popped out at me is like, okay, yeah, I'm going to go with that one. Cause that doesn't get as much as re much respect as it should have. Hmm. Um, and my least favorite, that was hard too, because A Hard Day's Night to me is really a perfect album. Um, yeah. But I went with I'll Cry instead. Um, but I'm not sure why. Uh, just sort of, I don't know. Uh, I guess I like it in some minuscule way 
slightly less than some of the others. I mean, look, you can't pick If I Fell as your least favorite. You can't pick And I Love Her as your least favorite. You know, mm-hmm. it, it had to get down to something and I'll cry instead. Just that's it for me. Okay. Hard Day's Night is a tough one. It really is. That album. It's so consistently strong all the way through. Yeah. Darren, your your picks. All right. Uh, my favorite. I'm happy just to dance with you. Um, What's going on here? Uh, but what I also did, this was because I agree with your opinion uh, of, of A Hard Day's Night. It's a perfect album. So I, I, I had a couple of other little honorable mentions. I, I should have known better. Mm-hmm. Um, and tell me why. Uh, again, I, I tend to, I notice I tend to go for like those punchy again, here's, here it comes, power pop-ish type mm-hmm. songs that got a little, little clout behind them. Um, this one's going to be the first song choice on either category that's going to make uh, everyone fall on the floor when I say that my least favorite is the title track, A Hard Day's Night. Mm-hmm. And that could probably be simply the case of, I've heard it so much over the years. Hmm. You know what I mean, and 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 I would actually say that probably is why it tends to be because I like it a lot, and it falls into the into that you know the categories that of of the things and the early Beatles songs that I like. But I I think it probably is because it's been I've heard it so much over the years hmm. uh, that it ends up being. Um, the one that I, you know, say, you know, that's maybe my least favorite. Um, you know, it's a better song probably at, than say something like when I get home. Mm-hmm. Well, when I get home is a little fresher because again, don't hear it as much and things we said today, same thing. Um, and that's why I ended up going with the hard days night as strong and brilliant of a song as it is. I think it's simply a case I'm just a little tired of hearing that. Yeah. You know. Shame. I, I try not to let exposure and airplay affect my opinion. You know, it's, it's still, you know, I know exactly what you're saying, um, Darren, because when it comes to favorites, I veer away from the hits because those are the ones that I've heard the most. I try yeah. to focus on the ones that don't get as much airplay because they sound fresher that way. I think it's a radio thing, actually. Uh, it sounds funny, but in general, I have had, um, in through the years of WFUV, there have been bands, albums, and songs that at one point, you know, I used to go crazy for. Mm. That one day I was like, you know what? I'm okay if I never hear this band again, and I like them. That's one of the bad things about, actually, when you work in radio, Hmm. that you can get tired of things you like a lot because hmm. you're hearing them every day in a in a certain setting that when you step away it's like no nah, i don't i don't have to hear that but i love it so and i don't want to hear it what's wrong with me the sort of layla layla slash stairway to heaven syndrome yep yeah yeah, yeah i used to yeah layla's a good example because that's one of my favorite albums of all time by any artist uh, and when Layla used to come on the radio years ago, um, volume went up. And today, not so much. And I think the backlash against Stairway to Heaven, now when I hear Stairway to Heaven on the radio, I'm like, oh, you don't hear that often. <gasps> Never thought I'd say that. You know, because everyone back, you know, they backed off it for. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I was so burnt out on Stairway to Heaven very quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's taken me so many years to to enjoy it again when it does come on yeah. always recognizing the fact that it's a great song my wife often brings this up when we started dating in uh he actually does have to think what year 91 um we were in the car and i, I had a classic rock station on um stay where to heaven comes on and i must have i responded to uh playing this again and my wife goes that sounds nice i've never heard this before yeah. and i was like oh to have your ears <laughs> you know what i mean um it was like this song and then i go on to explain to her 
is the one this and maybe like maybe free bird or something yeah. is the one that people go to and like no no more even robert plant has said that you know the attention stay where to heaven got hurts zeppelin mm. um more you said this years ago but uh the, to have fresh ears sometimes i wish i wish i could with some of these things you know i'd love to hear the song of hard days night today for the first time mm. because i know that it would floor me right so you know, i was anyway. thinking um while you were talking that uh, that possibly my thing with i'll cry instead is that if you think of it, there's this like group of Lennon songs, I'll cry instead, you can't do that, run for your life, that have this kind of not nice edge, you know, it's like it's like aggression and uh and anger. And uh and maybe I and I think I, I see I'll cry instead as part of that kind of thing. Like all the songs, really, but still. Uh-huh. There's just there's just a, a a mood about them. Anyway, run for your life is a little disturbing though. Mm. Uh, <laughs> however, the disturbing line is really lifted from an Elvis record. <laughs> you know, no one blames Elvis. No, one, <laughs> no one comes up with you know uh, that Elvis is 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 a problem. It's always Lennon and Run for Your Life. <laughs> And even Lennon said he was he one of his least favorite songs of his, or one that he really didn't like at all. Hmm. But um, anyway. I didn't write it down, Alan. What did you pick as your least favorite on Hard Day's Night? Um, I'll cry instead. Right, right. Okay, okay. I forgot to write it down. Okay, for me, a Hard Day's Night was really impossible. I knew I wasn't going to pick a Hard Day's Night for a favorite. I knew I wasn't going to pick Can't Buy Me Love. I'm, I veer away from the singles. So um, I happened to, I put four songs here for a favorite because it's really impossible. Um, I have You Can't Do That, despite what you just said there, Alan, being an aggressive, violent type song. It's just such a uh, solid fucker. And um, <laughs> you know what? Um, I was just saying about the Beatles being an R&B band. I neglected to say that on their original songs, they can sound like an R&B band. And such is the case with You Can't Do That. It certainly was the case with your pick, Darren, for least favorite of with the Beatles, Money. I mean, my God, listen to Lennon's vocals on Money, and oh, such a, a you know a loud, raucous version of that song. And you can't do that's fantastic. I love the lead guitar part in the middle. Um, it just uh, it's an amazing rock song. It really is. It's one of the best early rock songs. There. I also had to put, even though it was a single in America. Yeah, you know, both If I Fell and And I Love Her. They're two of their greatest love songs yeah. back, back there. If I Fell, I think, doesn't get enough credit at all. It, the way that that introduction flows right into the to the song. Um it's it's um it's magnificent. Um and I also happen to like Anytime at All a lot. Anytime at all is one of those songs that I always kind of wish was a single, even though the Beatles had so many hits at the time. But how more perfect in, in two minutes and 10 seconds can you get of the Beatles and with a great hook, one or two yeah. listens, and, and it's stuck in your head. And it's another one of those songs with, although there's a drum beat at the very beginning, go right into the chorus. And, um, you know, it, it, once once you hear it a few times, it's there. It's just such a, a great commercial pop and rock song. Um, the Beatles had so many of those that weren't singles still for all the hits the Beatles had, they could have had plenty more. Anytime at all is this is one of those songs like the piano bit in the middle. Everything they packed so much in two minutes, <laughs> so many of these songs. Um, so now we'll do Beatles for sale and we'll start with Darren. This one, I actually, now I'm looking at the, the songs here, and it's like, hey, you could have picked that, you could have picked this. But in my notes, I actually picked one of each in each category. So, see, in, in just an, a, a day, my views on albums and are changing. But um, for my favorite track on Beatles for Sale, I'm going to go with uh, I'll Follow the Sun. Um, Beautiful McCartney tune for many of the same reasons of, uh, that uh, 
we've heard well, Ken especially mentioning If I Fell and, and I Love Her and um, that's why I'm going with I'll Follow the Sun for very similar reasons. Mm-hmm. And my least favorite, and this is um, this is definitely a case of, I've just heard it a lot, uh, not even just by the Beatles. And my least favorite is rock and roll music. Um, Beach Boys. Um, I don't know. It just seems like rock and roll music to me seems like the Beatles did that type of rock cover a bunch of times in those early years. It never knocked me out from the beginning. So um, it's this is an album that most people, I think, maybe I shouldn't say most, many people, including myself, will gravitate towards when you're picking what is the least, what is the least of the Beatles albums. Mm. And it's kind of easy to point to Beatles for sale till you break it apart. And it's like, oh, I like that song. I like that song a lot. I like that. You know, even Mr. Moonlight, it's not great, but it gets this attention like it's Satan's spawn sometimes. Um, you know, breaking it to, into pieces. I remember hearing Words of Love for the first time, which was when I got my copy of the Love Songs collection. Um, that was my introduction to that. And I always loved Words of Love a lot. Didn't And I didn't know Buddy Holly's version. Hmm. So breaking the album into pieces and taking a look at the individual songs, Beatles for Sale is great. Something about what happens, I guess, maybe it was because there was a step back with the number of covers Hmm. on this album. So rock and roll music is my least favorite. I'll Follow the Sun uh, is my pick for favorite, but every little, it could be every little thing tomorrow, you know, or uh, um. I think it's very ballsy to have no reply and I'm a loser uh, up up top of the, the beginning of the album, especially I'm a, a song like I'm a loser mm-hmm. right up at the beginning of the album is I it speaks volumes for Lennon, the songwriter, mm-hmm. you know, and what the Beatles, how the Beatles were in a world all to themselves. So. Well, I agree. With you. <laughs> Alan. Okay. Um, you know, we I think we did a show about Beatles for sale once. It might have been in the pre-Darren era. Um <clears throat> there was a pre-Darren era? It was, yes. Yeah, primordial. <laughs> <laughs> um and and um and, and I think in that show I said it was one of like that and let it be probably are my least two least favorite two Beatles albums. Um and and for me it was because sort of after all the touring and the filming and the, you know, everything that they had gone through um, bef- right up to when they made Beatles for sale, it just seemed to me that they were kind of, you know, tired. They really needed a, a break. They, if they had had a two month break before Beatles for sale, it would have been a completely different album, but maybe it wouldn't have. Anyway, uh, my choice for the best um, is eight days a week. Um, I just love that song. You know, it has a fade in. It's got a great chord progression. Um, we know from anthology that they experimented with different uh, meters and, uh, you know, settled on on this. The harmonies are great. Uh, Lennon has said that, you know, it's just a throwaway song. He didn't really care about it. And Fine. You know, if you're John Lennon, you have the luxury of saying stuff like that. Um, as a listener, it's a lot of fun. Um, so and my least favorite is Mr. Moonlight. Um, and I'm not sure entirely why. Uh, I think I know why. Uh, I mean, John's vocal intro, that is just incredible. You know, mm-hmm. it, so it's it's hard to sort of dislike a song with that kind of performance. I think what it is that bothers me about it is the organ part. Yeah. You know, that it just, I don't know, you know, I, maybe if they had done it without an organ part, I might have a totally different view of it, but I just don't like the organ part. So maybe that's, that's it, but okay. Eight days a week and Mr. Moonlight. All right. I'm just realizing that I never gave my least favorite from A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> oh. okay. So my least favorite is When I Get Home. 
Mm. But I, think I said uh, not too long ago that it's a song that I'm really appreciating a lot more now. It's one that I didn't give enough credit to. Kind of, you know, when you think about it, it starts really odd with the whoa, oh, ha part. Um, but again, another song with a, a real strong R&B feel to it. And even John said it was like a Wilson Pickett type song in yeah. his mind. Um, There's one other thing in its favor. Um, years ago, Mitch Miller... <laughs> Remember Mitch Miller sing along with Mitch, Mitch Miller, you know, he, he had been in charge of Columbia's pop stuff and he just was totally anti-rock and he was anti-rock way after he left Columbia and was just an old guy. Yeah. Hear that? That was Mitch. I think, <laughs> I think it was an ice, oh, ice cream truck. Anyway, um, <laughs> Mitch Miller did this uh, interview where he said, you know, I, one of the reasons I hate rock and roll is because they never have words that are more than two syllables. And I thought, when I get home, I've got no time for trivialities. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my response to Mitch Miller when I get home. <laughs> anyway. Come on, Mitch. Don't sit under the apple tree. <laughs> Mac. with anyone else but me <laughs> he'd prefer that there, we'll discuss trivialities under the apple tree <laughs> all right Beatles for sale I'm sorry to tell you this Darren yes my favorite is rock and roll music okay rock and roll music is electric I love their performance of it it's needless to say, John gives a great performance vocally. It's got so much energy in it. It's like two and a half minutes. An overall great performance. I love the the fact that you got um, John and Paul and George Martin at the piano, <laughs> which really drives the song, especially towards the end, the high notes that you hear at the piano. Um, and, you know, over the years, I've come to really appreciate the original versions of songs that the Beatles covered. But in the case of rock and roll music, I have to say the Beatles version is the best. Never cared for the Beach Boys version. Chuck Berry, of course, is it's a fantastic version. But there's just it's just it's lightning <laughs> when you listen to the Beatles performance of that. And um, you know, I don't think we give enough credit to the Beatles for doing great covers. I know how much we love the original songs, but the cover versions that they did, they did in most cases fantastic jobs. Um my least favorite oh wait a minute i also said um kind of like a runner-up uh, of a favorite i really like what you're doing a lot i think that song doesn't get nearly the credit it's not one that people pick out um too much but i love paul's vocals on it it's got a great melody to it um and you got that timpani introduction there uh yeah I should be saying every little thing, shouldn't I? Since it's that's my radio show. And uh, actually, that I believe that could have been a single. But Brian Epstein told Paul that it wouldn't be. He didn't have enough faith in it. Oh. You read the, the comment that Paul made. It was something like he was kind of writing off every little thing. At the time, he thought it could be a single. But Brian didn't think it could. Anyway, um, and least favorite... <sighs> I don't want to throw a dart at the song, but Mr. Moonlight only because I like all the other songs more. And I don't mind the organ solo in the middle because it's something that's different. If you listen to the version that the Beatles did at Live at the Star Club, where you had um, the lead guitar part on there, it didn't sound like it fit that well to the song for Mr. Moonlight. Um, so they had to use some other instrument for the solo. And the fact that they didn't use it that often <laughs> makes it stand out a little bit um and of course like we said john's vocals are off the charts to start off the song the way he did what strong vocals like that you know i love it it's another example of a, of a corny song that i still love um all right that's it let's let's uh let's do the next one which is help and alan what are your choices okay it was a hard one too um i was thinking of um you've got to hide your love away partly because the chord progression is the same chord progression as is used in the finale of the mozart 41st symphony um but i went with yesterday because 
you can't. I, I don't know. Dar- Darren was. I think had said that he was gonna. Uh, well, we'll see what Darren does. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, it's just an incredible song. It's an incredible arrangement. Uh, I realize it has only one beetle on it, but um, uh, you know, it's 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 one of those songs that's a, a bit of a you know compositional quantum leap for them, um, and you know we know how popular it is in terms of covers and, and everything else. And uh, I, I, I think it deserves it um, for least favorite. Tell me what you say. There's a number of, of songs on the help album that use the electric piano and it's, it's sound I'm not crazy about. And it, it's in that one particularly and, and a few others, but um, I, I the p- electric piano, the harmonies seem a little bit off to me. And um, it's just, you know, but again, it's like, like we say, you know, it's if, if we we're just playing the album, I wouldn't stop and say, get that off. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's just that in terms of everything else on help, it's the one I like least. Okay. Good choices. Darren, what say you? Help! <laughs> My favorite song on Help would probably be The Night Before. Hmm. Okay. That was just the thing. That's always been just a song. I don't have any reason why. I just always like that song a lot. That and Another Girl. Although I did put in parentheses. Because I, I, these Rubber Soul and Help, I still, to this day, the U.S. version and the U.K. versions, I get confused and... I good thing I checked and just double checked the tr- track listing on the UK help because I would have forgot if I needed someone. Um, uh, so that was like an honorable mention. I was considering going with if I needed someone, but um, think for yourself. I'll pick first. I love the what is the fuzz bass on 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 that. You're jumping to rubber soul now. I am because I'm reading the wrong line here. So strike this from from your record, folks. You didn't hear any of that. Um, uh, I know many of you don't pay any attention to me in the first place, so hopefully you weren't paying attention. Uh, the Night Before, I see what I did here with my notes. Uh, the Night Before is my pick for help. Hmm. Okay? Favorite. And the honorable mention was, I've just seen a face. That's what I meant to uh, to say. But uh, So The Night Before, and I'm going to kind of get off camera here so I don't get hit with anything. When I pick Yesterday is my least favorite uh, from help. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know what it is about yesterday. To me, I find it dull. Hmm. I've always found that the, the 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 melody of yesterday to be dull. Really, uh, it, it just seems da, 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 da. it's not goes and doesn't it it doesn't work for me. Never did yesterday. Hmm. Um, with Dizzy Miss Lizzie is the you know outside for much the same reason. That I would pick rock and roll music on Beatles for sale. Dizzy Miss Lizzy was something I was a song I almost went with for help. But then I was like, no, I got to go with yesterday. This is how I feel, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm going to stand by it. Be nice. Keep your comments nice. Darren, you're a nice idiot. <laughs> so the night before and yesterday for help. Okay. Never thought I'd see the day when somebody would pick yesterday as their least. Well, I picked it for something else. We did a show uh, like maybe last year, and I don't recall why, but I've I've said that uh, it's a song that like I'm kind of off, tired of. That also was playing into it still, right. also because it's so overexposed. That doesn't help. Hmm. Okay. I All think right. it sort of speaks to the strength of the Beatles catalog if yesterday can be someone's least favorite song on a Beatles. Yeah, that's true. Uh, my choices here for help are kind of like what I said about any time at all. This is a song that should have been a single. You're going to lose that girl. It's probably my favorite. I mean, you talk about an infectious song, an infectious melody, the vocals, the harmonies the girl group thing going on john singing you're gonna lose that girl and the others yes yes you're gonna lose that girl um 
it's it's just an amazing pop record you know it's every now and then i like to talk about songs that should have been singles and um i realize it's being greedy because the beatles had so many hits but there's still so many that could have been um the songs that were album cuts by the beatles were stronger than a lot of artists out there with their own singles <laughs> that's just how great the beatles catalog was and um yeah it's that they nailed it on that song well they did on all their songs really least favorite probably you like me too much which i still like a lot main, mainly because of the the piano introduction and the honky tonk feel that it has but darren got me thinking about dizzy miss lizzie while i like the song and i love john's vocals a lot it's the same guitar riff throughout the whole song mm -hmm. na -na, na -na, na -na, you know over and over and over if there was a little variation you know might make it a little bit interesting um it's kind of the problem i have with not guilty <laughs> you know it's that repetitive oh. of the oh, song oh. Over, and over and over and not doing anything else with it but um yeah so those would be my choices you're going to lose that girl and least favorite you like me too much and dizzy miss lizzie okay rubber soul this should be fascinating. <laughs> Rubber Soul and Revolver. Oh my God. Yeah, it's hard. Really, all of them. All but um, you start, Darren, for Rubber Soul. I already kind of blew it with the my pick for favorite because I mentioned I was reading the wrong line here. Um, Think for yourself was the one I went with from the UK Rubber Soul, but it's it is the truth. That's probably the one album where the difference between the U.S. and the U.K. still to this day, I get confused over what songs belong where. Mm. Um, so um, think for yourself, though, uh, it would today was my pick for Rubber Soul. But Rubber Soul is a type of album where, as I said earlier, later in the week, if we did the show again, I might pick if I needed someone, which I put as my runner up mm. uh, from the U.K. Rubber Soul. And here's another one that's going to have people scratching their heads, I'm sure. My least favorite from from the UK Rubber Soul, Drive My Car. Again, it could be another issue of overexposure. Um, I don't know. I find I find it to be a little bit of an awkward melody. You know the the. No, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? And hearing it when I was a kid, the song didn't really make it make sense to me either. Um, and that I have not been able to get rid of uh, out of my head, clear it and go, oh, no, no, this is what it was about. But back then it was like, wait, wait, he can't drive himself? <laughs> <laughs> well, well you, you know, come on. But uh, so drive my car. Um, Drops to the bottom. Uh, the same type thing with um, I think Ticket to Ride uh, would be another song that I would pick that I'm, but that's clearly I always think of those two. Maybe it's because it's ride and car. Um, Ticket to Ride was a song that I always never really was too crazy about, but again, it could be ex overexposure. But in the case of Drive My Car, I just find it an awkward song, um, in many ways. So. <laughs> Is it possible that you feel this way because you became so used to the American rubber soul, starting with I've Just Seen a Face? It could be. A lot of people yeah. feel like it was yeah. an appropriate song to kick off the album, giving it a, a folk feel, whereas Drive My Car is more R&B-ish. See, me. that's another, I got to think about it. It was yesterday and today for Drive My Car? Yes. So yeah. that song has a different... It could very well be that because it just, just sits in a different place mm. for so many years. I heard yesterday and today, which I think is a great album. Um, one of the few times, maybe the first time where Capital kind of did something that you're like, you know, they put together a nice album here. Um, but uh, Drive My Car, maybe because it sounds different. It stands apart. It's It, it stands. Uh, what's the word? How am I putting it? Amongst the other, the Rubber Soul songs, to me, it doesn't belong there. You know, I, I don't know. But for uh, whatever reason, uh, least favorite, Drive My Car, I think for yourself, 
right now, today, is my favorite. Very interesting. I love George getting attention. <laughs> yeah, I realized that after the fact that I went with, you know, even my runner up, if I needed someone. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Alan, how about your choices? Okay. So my um, favorite, it, well, not my favorite, but the one I picked this time <laughs> <laughs> is Nowhere Man. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it uh, just thinking back to the time when I was a kid and it was a single in the U S and uh, I, I, I just loved it. And, you know, that, that sort of choral intro that they do brilliant. Then the way the guitar comes in, love it. Um, mm. And I like the, the sort of introspectiveness of it, you know, the, the, the self doubt yeah. and, uh, you know, these kind of things that John is thinking about and dealing with and putting in the song in a way it's, you know, it's a little different for a pop song, um, you know, at, at this point. I think probably everything else that at least on my list we've mentioned are really just love songs. This isn't a love song. It's something else. It's something a little more thoughtful. Um, so Nowhere Man, I, I think, is a, you know, good choice for today <laughs> i thought about picking that as my favorite too yeah and my least favorite is wait i'm not sure mm -hmm. why maybe maybe i'm just discovering as we go through this that i have a prejudice against Beatles songs with organs although i like it's only a northern song so you know i don't know scratch that theory wait just seems mm -hmm. um there's there's just something about it that for me, goes to the bottom of the rubber soul list. Okay. Um, let's see. My choices, I have a tie for my favorite. Um, In My Life is definitely one of them. Um, it's funny, growing up listening to, to Rubber Soul, I always recognize In My Life as a really nice song, and now it's like one of their greatest love songs ever. Yeah. It's one of the greatest love songs, period. Everything about it. I love the guitar intro, the da 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 it's just very touching lyrics. I love what George Martin did with the piano solo in the middle, where when it was sped up, it sounded kind of like a harpsichord, which is what I always thought it was growing up as a kid, but it wasn't a harpsichord. It was a piano that he used and um, gave it kind of a classical Baroque feel in a way. And uh, harmonies are fantastic. It's just, um, you know, when it comes to love songs, the Beatles really delivered and, uh, that's definitely one of their greatest. I also, for some reason, ever since I was a kid, You Won't See Me has been one of my favorite Beatles songs. Could just be that I love the melody. I love Paul's vocals throughout it. Um, you know, the call and answer back and forth, the You Won't See Me part. Um, just a really great melody overall. And um, just something that's always stuck with me for that reason. I'm very much melody driven. And... Um, and from an American point of view, it has a slight touch of British exoticism, which is when I call you up, your lines engaged. We don't say that here. We say busy, <laughs> you know, but engage is kind of cool, you know. <laughs> yep. And my least favorite, probably what goes on, which I still like a lot. Yeah. You know, it's still a very catchy song. It works really well. Would love to know the five words that Ringo contributed to it. <laughs> um, you know, maybe sometimes when you learn more about the history of things, it might color your judgment on certain songs. Like uh, you might think less of a song like Wait, because Wait was left over from the Help album. Mm -hmm. They weren't really happy enough with the song. And then, you know, they had a wrap up work on rubber soul and wait it's probably one of the last songs i think that that they did um same thing with what goes on which really was a very early lennon mccartney song from around late 50s 1960 or so and they brought that back there was that demo that they sold a few years ago of what goes on which uh i don't think any of us have heard right um yeah but i mean i like it <laughs> it's still a good song i'm glad that ringo does it live um 
but probably it's not one that grabs me as much as others. I never had a problem with Run For Your Life. I know it's not a PC song these days. Um, and I don't really care about that as much. Yeah, I, Run For Your Life could have worked as a single, you know, at the time. You know? Anyway, let's do the next one. Wait, Ken, I want to make sure. Uh, in My Life and You Won't See Me were your favorites? Yeah, and What Goes On, my least What Goes On and Wait. No, Wait was Alan's. Okay, What Goes On. Yeah. And, I don't know why I'm keeping track, but I'm keeping track. So, Revolver. What a lot of fans these days hail as being their best album. We all have a different opinion. But... uh a breathtaking body of work for sure and which they really stretch their creativity in so many different genres of musical styles and all the different recording techniques that they started to use for different sounds this is a real tough one to pick your favorite at least for me anyway let's start with um alan this time okay i'm gonna go with here there and everywhere um I love everything on Revolver, really, uh, but here, there, and everywhere, partly because of um, the way uh, <clears throat> in the uh, 5.1 mix, you can separate all those background vocals, and um, and I got into listening to it, just the background vocals um, after that came out, and, and those background vocals are incredible. They're very much in the style of Brian Wilson. It's kind of almost as if they sort of poured over you know pet sounds and uh other beach boys things and and sort of embrace this as an approach to uh to vocal harmonies um and then just excelled at it in this song but it's also just a great song even if you listen to the whole thing not just the vocal harmonies mm. uh so I'm going to go with that, but uh, it, I could equally go with pretty much anything else on the album. Um, and my runner up probably just because it's fun is and your bird can sing. Cause I love those twin guitars mm. um, and my least favorite. I, mean, I don't know. I went with good day sunshine. Um, mm -hmm. It just seems you know, it's it's a good song. I, I I I like it, but I may I guess I like it less than the other thirteen songs on the album. Okay, it's it's not easy to pick a least favorite it's, on there. It's it's really hard. And Rubber Soul too. I mean, I'm looking at my list now, and I'm thinking, well, you know, the Bridge of Weight is really good. <laughs> They've got that sort of you know you know steady steady tone, and and they're sort of building over it. And but you know what can you do? You had to pick. You had to pick a least favorite. So that was it at the moment. Okay, I mean, for someone like myself, how do you even decide between Eleanor Rigby and? Tomorrow never knows. <laughs> it's like, come on. I mean, such revolutionary songs right there. Um and and I'm only sleeping, you know, with the it, it it's got a lot going for it. And you know, I, I I think of it as um really yesterday and today because that's the way I grew up with, you know, mm. yesterday and today having I'm only sleeping and and it was one of my favorite songs on yesterday and today. So, but uh, I it was really hard. Anyway, next one of you. Okay, Darren. Uh, yeah, I uh, completely agree with Revolver being a, a tough one in this, but favorite wasn't hard for me at all because for as long as I can remember, one of my favorite Beatles songs of all time was And Your Bird Can Sing. Um, there he goes mentioning Power Pop again. That's one of the great, Two minute rock songs ever by anybody, and um, I'll go outside with anybody and get in a fight with them to defend that song because that is, to me, that is the one. Uh, and your bird can sing, and a little honorable mention in small print for "Love You Too," just because that song is just such a weird song. "Love You Too," hmm. um, I always liked it because it was just weird, and I don't understand the title either. Yep. "Love You Too." Well, two's misspelled, isn't it, George? Shouldn't it be two O's? Love you too. I would think. Um, love you to love you to do something. <laughs> oh, it's an incomplete sentence. Yeah. Hmm. 
All right. So Anya Bird can sing is my no brainer pick for me. One of the easiest. The first one I picked when I did this was go right to Revolver and uh, pick Anya Bird can sing. And my least favorite. And this is only because something's got to drop to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I know it's because of overexposure. Yellow submarine. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. All right. Has anyone ever explained, was there ever an explanation as to why Love You Too was called Love You Too, T-O? Not that I've seen. I could. I mean, I guess it could be a misspelling. And they just left it that way all these years? Well, look at the Zombies album, Odyssey and Oracle. Mm -hmm. Odyssey is misspelled. And they knew about it. I think I think they it was discovered, but they just left it. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Never made much sense to me. Anyway, for me, uh, Revolver, you'll love this. I actually have three favorites. And your bird can sing, <laughs> which I've been saying for, for so long is two minutes of bliss. Mm -hmm. um, for the same reasons you guys gave the dual guitar lines. It's another song that should have been a single. I never get tired of it. I can hear it every single day for the rest of my life. and never get tired of Enya Bird can sing. Um, so much power and so much work packed into two minutes. Beatles were just geniuses at putting all that together. Um, I wanted to include For No One, which I think is a song that a lot more people appreciate now and it's gotten a lot more respect. I have, um, you know, a lot of um, admiration for songs that say a lot in just a couple of minutes. Eleanor Rigby is a perfect example of that. For No One is a perfect ex example of that. In two minutes time, it tells an entire story about a relationship there and how it's not working out. And um, the melody is fantastic. The French horn solo from Alan Civil. Um, I loved hearing on the Revolver box set when you, when you just heard uh, Paul's piano playing more pronounced on that song. Um, it's just a, a wonderful song with so much going on in just two minutes. Incredible melody in that. And then I also had to put in Here, There, and Everywhere, which is, you know, like in my life, one of their greatest love songs. Least favorite? That's really tough. It could I could um, put Yellow Submarine in there for the same reason of maybe being tired of it. But again, I don't want radio airplay to affect <laughs> my opinion here, but probably... Maybe Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert is still a great song. It's another song that could have just as easily have been a single. But it doesn't grab me as much as the others. And there's got to be a song that you put at the bottom. So that's it for Revolver for me. Let's do Sgt. Pepper now. <clears throat> um, can we include Sgt. Pepper in a groove? <laughs> You beat me to it. I was going to say that. You stole my joke. Oh, man. Alan, we'll start with you. Okay. I'm going to go with The Day in the Life as uh, my favorite, just because it's, you know, it's it's so ambitious. Um, the whole album is ambitious, but um, as a single cut, that one has so much going on and, uh, you know, is one of those great sort of Frankenstein's Lennon and McCartney collaborations of, you know, two separate songs being pulled together and they seem to work perfectly. Um, and then there's the orchestral thing. I mean, it just everything about it, like final chord. It's, it's just, it's just incredible. Um, least favorite. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> least favorite. Um, so I went with good morning, good morning. Um, for, I don't know why, maybe because it's, you know, it's really just sort of, you know, John himself has, I mean, even though earlier with eight days a week, I said, I don't really care what John has to say about it. I like it anyway. I'm going to go with John's dismissal of it as my excuse for putting it at the bottom of the pepper list. Um, it's really just him writing, you know, off a, 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 a cornflakes commercial um but then a lot of his songs on pepper are just things that he you know found you know found objects kind of things like mr kite you know right off the poster yeah. and this is right off a, a tv commercial and um 
you know, it, it, it serves a great purpose leading back into Sergeant Pepper with the animal noises at the end and all of that stuff. But if something has to be least favorite, I guess it has to be that. Not an easy job here. Yeah. No way. When I was a kid, I could have easily just said within you, without you. Mm -hmm. But having grown up and come to love within you, without you, obviously I can't do that now. So. Mm -hmm. All right, Darren. Um, for me, um, picking a favorite from Sergeant Pepper is so hard. I went with getting better. I don't really, you know, just to be a little different. Pick a song that gets, you know, heard a little less. Um, I remember, you know, it still kind of takes me back to when I heard Sgt. Pepper for the first time in the 70s. And, you know, after the songs I knew, Sgt. Pepper from the Blue Album with a, uh, with a little help from my friends. Mm. Seeing the Sky with Diamonds, that boom, boom, boom. The first new discovery from my ears was getting better. And it was like, wow. It was just, I loved it. And it stuck with me from when, and I had it on cassette. I still remember it as a little kid. So, uh, so getting better was my pick for my favorite. My least favorite, it, I picked two songs. That I do, I'm, 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 I'm not happy that I picked them, but again, something has to drop to the bottom in this type thing. Uh, so I picked within you without you, which unfairly gets kind of, maybe I've seen it get kind of brushed aside uh, as the point in the album where oh, it's, it's within you without you. Uh, but it was either that or being for the benefit of Mr. Kite as the two songs, maybe that kind of drop. Hmm. Um, I'm not comfortable picking those two or at least within you without you if it was one, but something, something has got to fall to the bottom. So that's, that's where I'm at. Okay. Um, for my favorite on Sergeant Pepper, I picked one that a lot of people dismiss these days and feel that, you ever you ever read comments online where if you could have put um, Strawberry Fields Forever and and Penny Lane on Sgt. Pepper, what two songs would you take off? <laughs> you know, um, and the song I picked here is one that a lot of people seem to want to take off. She's leaving home, which I think is I don't get that an absolute masterpiece yeah. of the song. It's a gorgeous melody. I love Paul's vocals on there. And I love the harmony between Paul and John and the counter melody. Mm -hmm. Plus the strings, plus the use of the harp. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a masterpiece that is still not given enough credit. And um, it really stands out for me. And like I said, and I feel like a hypocrite because I don't want radio airplay to... to really affect what i'm going to pick but i think when the blue album came out well the red and the blue it it had an effect on what radio stations would play and if you're going to go deeper into to albums and you're going to play songs that are not singles the songs that tended to get played from sergeant pepper were sergeant pepper with a little help from my friends lucy in the sky with diamonds and a day in the life and those are the ones i grew tired of first yeah so all the other songs, like you were saying about getting better, you know, it's a new song to you. Right. But my favorite moments on Sgt. Pepper tend to be everything else. <laughs> but what you hear at the very beginning and at the very end. And believe me, I recognize how brilliant the the songs are at the beginning and, and how creative and innovative and groundbreaking A Day in the Life was. But I do love everything else about the album. And um, She's Leaving Home really stands out for me as uh you know one of their finest moments you know on record to me we ever did a show of songs that we think deserve higher status you know she's leaving home would be right up there least favorite well probably being for the benefit of mr kite and i recognize all the inventiveness in that song too and the circus like circus like atmosphere that it was striving for and it's all executed well i just kind of grown a bit tired of it i don't know why my ears don't go right to that song and, and in, a, in a way you know while i'm glad that paul has done the song live for quite a while i wish he would do 
something else. You know, he's done almost everything from Saudi Arabia. He's never done when I'm 64 of them <laughs> live. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit tired of being for the benefit of Mr. Kite right now. But I still look at it as a brilliant song and a brilliant recording. Okay, Magical Mystery Tour. We'll start with Darren. Well, I love Magic. Who doesn't love Magical Mystery Tour? Again, thumbs up to Capitol Records for saying no EPs here. Let's just get all the non-album tracks from the singles from the same year. Oh, there are five of them. How perfect. <laughs> and they really did put together a virtually perfect album. I remember reading an article a long time ago about how pound for pound this particular writer felt Magical Mystery Tour was a better album than Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Um, I'm not going to go that far. But for sheer lunacy, my favorite is uh, on that is I Am the Walrus. Cuckoo, could you? Mm -hmm. um, with the with the little honorable mentions to the Fool on the Hill and Hello Goodbye, because um, I love those two as well. Uh, the Fool on the Hill for much the same reason that you know for no one or uh, what was it? I picked her. Um, I'll follow the sun. I think I, yeah, I chose that for Beatles for sale for those same reasons. It's just very. It's excellent introspective McCartney, The Fool on the Hill. Mm. Uh, but when all is said and done, I am the walrus, just because it's just sheer lunacy. Um, least favorite, falling for the same reason that I picked Yellow Submarine and uh, and A Hard Day's Night, my least favorite off a Magical Mystery Tour is All You Need Is Love. Mm. Uh, I, and and it largely because it just... You heard it, you hear it all the time, you know, so it just gets tired. It's it's that very overtly simple sentiment, which is what it's all about. But at the same time, it just doesn't it's just too much. Mm. So that's all. OK. Hey, all I need is love is one of the few Beatles songs that I really am burnt down on. Yeah. At the moment. Hate to say it. You know, I love the song. Yeah, sure. Too much. Yeah. All right, Alan. Watch, he picks All You Need Is Love as his favorite. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, if I were to pick three, that would be one of them. Um, because Strawberry Fields, Walrus, and All You Need Is Love are like three absolutely top shelf Lennon songs. But Strawberry Fields Forever is actually one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, so it has to be that. I mean, just logically. Um, you know, for all the reasons we know, the whole story of the multiple versions and the, you know, bringing it together, making, in, making it into this incredible uh, finished product. Uh, and, you know, yeah. Uh, and, and my least favorite is Blue Jay Way. Um, mm. I like Blue Jay Way. <laughs> like, I like Good Morning, Good Morning. Um, but Blue Jay Way, you know, kind of drones on a bit. And um, maybe it's the organ. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm discovering this thing about my attitude towards Beatles songs with organs. I never really thought about it before till we, you know, started doing this. Um, uh, it, yeah, I guess just of, of the Magical Mystery Tour songs, I'm not tired of All You Need Is Love. I'm not tired of any of them. Um, but Blue Jay Way is kind of like a down moment in all that brightness. So going with that. Okay. Okay. So my picks would have been uh, favorite Penny Lane. You yeah. can't get a more perfect pop song than Penny Lane. <laughs> That's it. Three minutes. Absolutely wonderful. Great melody. The entire arrangement. You know, the piccolo trumpet. Everything in there is just top tier McCartney. That's, you know. And of course, a case could be made that Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever is to a lot of people the greatest single they ever released. You know, back to back, you can't get two greater songs than, than Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, I think. I also have as an honorable mention Fool on the Hill. 
that's another one. Great melody, great vocals from McCartney. The use of the recorder, I think, is very effective in there. Um, and my least favorite, I happen to love Blue Jay Way. You know, I like a lot of the psychedelic stuff, but I love the whole arrangement with with the strings and all. Um, I'd probably be flying. And I almost, I thought about picking that as my favorite uh, at one point. Really? Yeah. Again, Ooh. probably because underexposed, the opposite. Right. You know, and an instrumental in the middle of all of, you know. So for the like album, are we picking two favorites and two non-favorites or two least well, favorites? There's no real rule. You know, if, you, if there's a certain album where you want to pick two, two and then you just want to pick one. Hmm? There's two discs, 30 songs. Oh, the White Album. Yes. Oh, uh, no, it's still, <laughs> it's still one thing. It, do whatever you want. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know, for the most part, it's what's your favorite, what's your least favorite. And if you want to have an honorable mention or two, that's fine. But um, Flying is still an interesting record, you know, and I like the melody behind it. And I love the sound of the guitars. The, mm -hmm. like the bending of the guitar is that sound that they have in it and i love the fact that ringo's vocal is pushed up there so you hear him a lot in it you know i love the psychedelic feel of it but you know i like all the other songs more that's all so now we'll tackle the white album it's probably even more difficult because there's 30 tracks on there so um in this case um who started the last time i think we start with alan this time Okay, so I was taking the view that we're doing it per physical disc. So on disc one, well, my guitar gently weeps, favorite. Okay. Martha, my dear, least favorite. I like Martha, my dear. Like, I like all the ones that are my least favorites. Um, but of all these songs, it just, just seems a little the most, um, to me, expendable. It's... Uh, you know, it's nice. It's pretty. It's about his sheepdog. Um, but I don't know. Huge you don't distance. like it as much. Yeah, huge distance between that and Well, My Guitar Gently Weeps. And on disc two, of course, I pick Revolution number nine because it's brilliant. Um, but I know that I will never convince most people of that. I've I've tried it sometimes at great length. Did you got me length. convinced? what you got me convinced i i, I love her i did i think it's so oh, important wow. i don't think that's a critical part of the white album yeah cool is it something uh, is revolution number nine something that you can listen to in your room with speakers on or is it something that you got to have the headphones on well actually you want to have the surround mix mm. the surround mix of that is incredible so you need all the speakers on it <laughs> It used to spook me a little when I got the White Album. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was 11. Yeah. I was around 11 years old when I got the White Album. Yeah, the Revolution, I took a little, you know, even right from the beginning, those voices, it's, you know, uh, that George Martin, the mumbling. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And there are so many narratives for it. I mean, you know, these days I think of it really as, you know, the dissolution of, uh, of the society that they're, you know talking about in revolution and the revolution coming and this is what the revolution is is revolution nine yeah. um but at the time you know, or a little after the time really around the time abbey road um when the paul is dead thing was going on um i don't know if you remember wnewfm had uh, or it was either them or plj i can't remember which had a you know a long special where they yeah. play yeah or, um, and apart from number nine backwards, turn me on dead man, they presented this whole narrative of, okay, now here's where the car crashes and then you hear the flames and then you yep. hear, you know, uh, and it, it made it completely worked as a narrative for that, that piece. But, um, you know, I think of it now really is what, what I think it was supposed to be, which is the, the revolution, um, uh, I thought, you know, if you guys weren't going to accept that as, <laughs> as a song, um, I would Savoy Truffle as, as a sort of alternative for disc two. Um, and least favorite, 
on disc two, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. I well, like it. I, I don't know. Uh, there's just, I think the sort of clangorousness of it, which a lot of the times is fun, um, just sometimes to me seems a little bit too much, you know, where there's, you know, da, 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 the I can't, re- don't know what they're actually even doing, but they're, it, it's almost as if they're taking a bell and or a cowbell and, and, and and hitting it fast, you know, uh, while other stuff is going on. And it's, you know, certain times, that's what I like about it. But when I was trying to pick one to be least favorite, that came in. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay. I kind of like songs that have like an unusual introduction, like, everybody's got something to hide then it goes into the verses at a like a faster speed it's just so different in, in a way there's um you take a look at drive my car and how does how that introduction is very unusual going right into the first verse you know i love that kind of stuff <laughs> very very non-typical yeah uh, yeah darren what are your choices um For a uh, favorite, I went with Helter Skelter, hmm. which, if I was a baseball player, would be my walk-up song. <laughs> um, and also, almost a tie, Happiness is a Warm Gun. Um, great Lennon vocal, great Lennon song. Um, loved it from the very beginning. Just I don't know why. It's just, just, you know, there's a bunch of things on that, on the White Album, because there's 30 songs to pick from that I could have gone with. And I have found uh, through the years, my appreciation's changed about a bunch of songs. Like lately, I've really gravitated to Long, Long, Long. Yes. Okay. Uh, For whatever reason, just, you know, it was time for my ears to, you know, pay attention to that one. But I went with Helter Skelter and Happiness as a warm gun more times than not two of my favorites from the album um least favorite there there's actually a bunch because these songs as they stand alone don't really hold up for me by themselves within the experience of the white album fine but um i actually have three um piggies is one uh rocky raccoon is another and wild honey pie now i love and i know you what you said at the beginning at the top about these very short songs that aren't really complete mm-hmm. songs like you know here there and everywhere uh wild honey i like those kinds of snippets and those would count as songs in my book uh, but like wild honey pie to me is almost like why why paul I, eh. You know, so, is it is it a, a song to you, a complete song, or is it yeah, more? Yeah, it is. It is. To me, it's almost like an introduction. I understand. Into- yeah, I understand. I understand where you're coming from with that. But it is a song to me. And that, you know, I, I like those kinds of crazy things. Hmm. Um, but Wild Honey Pie is just, that's one that I'm like, all right, you could have left that one off, Paul. That does, just doesn't, nothing's happening there. Um, piggies. Um, I don't know. It just it's maybe. I I mean, I hate to say this and just like leave myself open for abuse. I never really understood piggies. I I kind of know what it's sort of a a little bit of a political commentary thing there. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, though, perhaps because it's a British opinion or a British view, it just didn't. I don't know. As as a, as a Beatles song by itself, it doesn't work. It works amongst the madness that is the White Album, though. Oh, Same hmm. with Rocky Raccoon. That was another one, like, no, oh. you know, okay. I, I don't know. I what's going on here? You know, hmm. um, I find it very fascinating though that that little introduction is just like, what is it? One one keynote on a, on a Mellotron. Oh, you're talking about Bungalow Bill. Bungalow Bill. I'm sorry. Forget it. Strike that. I did it again. Got confused. 
I confuse easily. Hmm. So, anyway, strike that. So that's where I'm going to leave it with those. All right. Um, my choices would be for favorite. Um, while my guitar gently weeps, despite the fact that it still gets a lot of airplay, never tire of it. You know, I am totally engaged. Here's that British word. Yeah. Uh, when I hear the song, you know, I just bury myself in the song. I love the melody. I love the guitar playing. I love Eric Clapton's guitar solo in it. I never get tired of while my guitar gently weeps. And there's a reason why it's, you know, between that something and here comes the sun. Those are usually the top three Harrison Beatles songs. And um, how can you not praise that song? Um, and I really have grown to love happiness as a warm gun, which is a, a contender there for a favorite. You know, I love the fact and, and, you know, Lennon sometimes is critical of, of McCartney saying, Oh, these are all half finished songs that he strung together. Like on Abbey road. Well, happiness is a warm gun is three different songs. Yeah. That, Come together you know and somehow they all flow and and that alone there's a talent that goes with being able to make that work they're in different tempos and yet somehow you get the feeling they could have just done the song exactly that way which they did anyway but um no i love happiness is the warm gun it's so off the wall you know I love when John's doing the when I hold you in my arms, that whole bit at the end. Um, yeah, I love happiness as a warm gun. I like quirky. Least favorite, I'm gonna put Wild Honey Pie in there if you want to consider what I what I feel are not complete songs. Um, if it was a complete song, um, uh, Cry Baby Cry is not one that grabs me all that much. Um, but I still love it. You know, um, those would be my picks. I didn't pick one from each disc, but. Uh, so you picked Cry Baby Cry as the least favorite? Yeah. I've, I've, I I've, think that is a full song. Yeah, that's what you I mean. No, oh, okay. It is a full song. Wild Honey Pie to me is not. Wild Honey Pie. And then While My Guitar Gently Weeps and Happiness is a Warm Gun are your favorites. Right. Yeah. So as we move on now to Yellow Submarine, I'm guessing we're only going to talk about the four new songs, newer songs on Yellow Submarine. So we can't include Yellow Submarine and All I Need Is Love. So of the four songs, <laughs> what's your favorite and what's your least favorite? Darren? Well, I kind of like did look at side one as a whole because um, oh. I did pick All You Need Is Love as the least favorite again. Okay. All right, and 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 could have mentioned Yellow Submarine. The two songs that I picked earlier on. Um, it's funny those four new songs. Um, all together now is cute, but I have I have them here is like almost like they're like meant to be like listened to together. Hey Bulldog, it's all too much. Only a northern song. They are three of my all time favorite Beatles songs for whatever reason. I love it's all too much. The psych it's just psychedelia. It's the Beatles psychedelics at their best. And same with only a northern song. I mean, George Harrison in my book hit two home runs with those two songs. And then Hey Bulldog, which is one of those songs that I think in recent years has got to be considered uh, uh, one of the top Beatles songs that is getting reevaluated and reappreciated. Is that a word? Reappreciated. I made it a word. You know, it's a song that a lot of people are like, that's a great song that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a lot of people were like, I don't know that one. Mm. It just seems that people are catching on to Hey Bulldog lately. Um, I can't separate those three. Well, if you, it's funny that of all albums, Yellow Submarine, I picked three songs as my favorites. <laughs> um, and, and there's something about side two of that album that I like a lot. Mm hmm. You know, I always loved to just play the whole side. Um, there's a vibe. There's just something very, very, you're in magical Beatles land. <laughs> With uh -huh. that entire side. Doesn't need the movie. Mm -hmm. Just just put it on and just let it go through. And 
It's there's something very like this is this is the the magical land that we all want to be in. Beetle land. Yep. Well, I suppose there are people out there that can listen to soundtrack albums that are all instrumental. And for some people that would be a struggle. Mm-hmm. You know, but the pieces that George Martin worked as separate pieces of work are really fantastic by themselves, separate from the movie. Yeah. I think. But um but you can you can always when you hear the different tracks you can visualize where it's being used. You know, Pepperland is so yeah. Happy brilliant yeah um yeah he did incredible work on the score for that on side two alan your choices okay um i'm going with it's all too much as my favorite um it's really kind of a a a powerful song it's got some great lyrics it's Mm. got uh you know great uh guitar that feedback that whole you know that whole intro and uh not to mention that we've got the problem of there really being sort of two several versions of it because there's a verse in the film that isn't in the song um but uh you know and it's a long song as it is even without that verse so um so that that i i like the feel of it i like the sound of it and uh and that's um, for me the the highlight on Yellow Submarine. And my least favorite would have to be All Together Now. Um, should I say it? <laughs> say it. I don't think counting counts as lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, I like it in all together now, actually. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm just I'm just uh, doing one of my hobby horses. But um, you know, of the four, um, I think it's in a way the most sort of mundane, you know, perfectly nice song. I have no real problem with it, but um, you know, it's 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 not to me in the league for sheer excitement as it's all too much. And I like only a northern song because of the sort of you know uh in joke lyrics and um uh what was the other um hey bulldog oh yeah oh yeah yeah hey bulldog is uh you know it's, it's a good rocker and it's got mm. a great video <laughs> so um yeah those are my two okay well your two were the same as my two <laughs> okay. uh, my favorite is it's all too much um there's a lot going on there they packed it with all different types of instrumentation on there that's george's one of his psychedelic songs to me it's kind of like his all you need is love if you think about it um and uh probably yeah well my least favorite is still a song that i love i love all together now it works for what it set itself out to do in the film to sing along at the end of the song yeah even though it's also used earlier um in the song as well um there's nothing wrong with something as simple as as all together now and um you know most people when they saw yellow submarine when it first came out and new audiences watch yellow submarine they leave the theater with all together now in their head oh. yeah um something to be said about whether or not you like that style of music or not it set itself out to do something and it did it right. I like all together now for that reason. It's just that I like it less than the other songs. And Hey Bulldog is a standout rocker. I love, you know, the just the piano intro. It's just a great riff to build the song around. And um, yeah, only a northern song is a lot of fun as well with the in jokes, like you said, Alan. And um, yeah. And I, I love weird ending of only a northern song where it's kind of like in suspense you know it doesn't really have any kind of smooth ending just leaves you hanging you know i like i i I often forget this um who's who's playing the lead the the guitar solo on uh hey bulldog is it george or john football there's a debate about that that's been going on for for a long time i believe that it's that it's george sounds to me most like it's george that's one of the more fiery guitar solos to be on a Beatles song. 
on on Hey Bulldog, and I always wondered exactly who that is. That sounds to me more like George. There's that one line with the no 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 yeah yeah that's George to me. Huh. But you know, we've been proven wrong. <laughs> Before... Watch <it's> Ringo. <laughs> No, I, I don't mean necessarily we. I mean, fans have been proven wrong. When, no, I know. When uh, you get new information coming to light, like, for example, Old Brown Shoe is supposed to be Paul on drums. That's what Kevin Howlett said in the um, Abbey Road box set. You know, I would never have said that before. This says John Lennon lead guitar. Where? Uh, what? What's the source? This is the source. The source, the source, and to be the impossible. Um, well, off Wikipedia, and then the sub, and then the um, footnote. Mm. Uh, Everett. Oh, uh, Walter Everett. Oh, I'm trying to open this. Okay. Walter Everett. Yep. Oh, Walter's been on our show in the past. I think before you joined us, Darren. Yeah, I don't I don't recall. Yeah. According to Walter Everett, lead guitar, John Lennon, double tracked vocals. McCartney gets harmony vocals. The rest is, you know, George guitar, drums, Ringo. Hmm. Anyway. All right. Uh it's time now for Abbey Road. <laughs> and I guess we, we include Her Majesty in this, right? <laughs> yes. Uh Alan, you are first. Oh boy. I was going to, you know, uh, I thought it would be cheating to do the Golden Slumbers medley, which <laughs> is sort of half of side two. Um, but that actually would be my first choice because it has so much in it, so much going on, including, you know, if you're taking it from Golden Slumbers all the way to the end, you've got the solos. The solos. That's that's an incredible moment to me. It's something they never really did. Had a had a, a guitar battle and a drum solo all together, and it's um, just sort of like everyone uh, uh, doing their signature on what turns out to be the last few moments of music um, that they were going to release. Not counting "Let It Be," which they should have released earlier. You know the whole thing. Um, so I think I might have had also a uh, an alternative. Well, yeah, I have two alternatives. Abbey Road's hard, you know. Um, Here comes the sun, and because were my alternatives, but maybe I'll, I'll I'll stick to my guns and cheat and go with the Golden Slumbers medley, um, most of side two, uh, and my least favorite would have to be. I have two choices there too, either Maxwell or Octopus's Garden. Like them both, you know, really. I mean, um, but probably like them a little less than everything else on the album. Okay. It's hard to make a case for something being your least favorite if you sort of like it anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know it's 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 really tough. I mean, Octopus's Garden could be my least favorite as well, and yet I love the song. It's yeah, simple, and I, and I feel guilty sort of singling out fifty percent of Ringo's Beatles era compositions as a least favorite. Mm. You know? Okay, Darren, your choices. I'm starting to not be able to read my, <laughs> you know, because I'm keeping track of what you guys are picking. Uh, for me, you know, the two there, there's two songs here. First off, for my for my money, if you said, uh, and there is many there are many people, and actually that includes members of my family that would like to put me on a desert island and just leave me out there. So if I got stuck on a desert island and I was only able to keep two albums, bring two albums with me, Abbey Road and The Dark Side of the Moon would be the two. Hmm. that I would be on on my desert island with. Uh, you Never Give Me Your Money has always been my favorite song on Abbey Road. It's the type of song, it's the classic McCartney building block songs. We've talked about Little Lamb Dragonfly and the medley on Red Rose Speedway and other tunes like that. Here it is, the genesis 
in, to my ears of that type of McCartney song, You Never Give Me Your Money. Mm -hmm. uh, with the honorable mention, a complete blowout the windows, crank it to 11, I Want You, She's So Heavy. If you're ever in a car with me when that song comes on, just put stuff in your ears because the because the radio is going as loud as possible. Mm -hmm. And um to this day, you know, I want you to I want to be on the highway driving and you hear me on the side streets two miles away, passing by with that song playing. Um and I'll tell you a funny story when I was uh when my kids were younger. Um, I used to, they were always amazed because I used to end the song. All right, Dad, how'd you do that? And I'm like, you know. <laughs> that's a very cool ending to a song to end so abruptly like oh, that. That's unbelievable, that ending. I love it. That used to freak me out. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was five, like Abbey Road came out in 69, I was still four. My dad, for some reason, bought, probably because he knew I loved the Beatles, but there was there was genuine interest on my my father's part. He brought home Let It Be and Abbey Road, I remember at the same time. Hmm. And I never got used to the ending of Side One on Abbey Road. I'd stand and look at the, look at, watch the record play. You know, and not the needle's still in there. That ends, you know, that always grabbed me from, from when I was a little kid. Probably the type of little quirky thing that 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 appealed to me that maybe made me a Beatle fan. Um but anyway, so those are my those are my two picks for uh favorite and least favorite, you know, it was actually not hard. Um <laughs> they're great songs, but Mean Mr. Mustard, uh, honorable mention, Polythene Pam. Um, you could pick one song out of a medley. It's all part of one to me. Yeah, I, I get it. I don't know. I just, I went and broke them apart. And I went, Mean Mr. Mustard, I thought was maybe, maybe, I mean, Abbey Road would not be Abbey Road without Mean Mr. Mustard in it, in the right smack in the middle of side two. But if you're going to break them apart as songs, that one seems to be one that, you know, would have been left to the side had it been a couple of years earlier and they weren't building an album the way they built side two of Abbey road. Hmm. Same for Polythene Pam. Um, but um, again, it wouldn't be Abbey road without the two of them, but something's got to fall to the bottom for me. So that's why I went with those two. Okay. Interesting choices. This is, you know, it, it's just another case of a very, difficult thing to pick from um i have three choices as my favorite i guess i'd have to go with the golden slumbers medley as my favorite with two runners up just because the whole arrangement of those three songs work together so well i could say that about everything on side two from you never give me your money as as a medley how they work together so well the sound of Paul's vocals on Golden Slumbers, the screaming, the brilliance of bringing back You Never Give Me Your Money into that medley there, how it works so well. And um, Ringo's drum solo, the the three guitarists all exchanging guitar solos. It's, it's such an incredible moment there on record. Um, and I also have to include something which is one of the greatest love songs ever, but it's, it's also a case of um, it's a, such a great recording too. Again, you could say this about so many Beatle records, but there's so much going on in something that I appreciate more now than I ever have. Paul's bass line there is so incredible. It adds so much to the song. Um, what Ringo brings to the drums, especially in that middle part, you're asking me, will my love grow? It's very interesting what he's playing there. And then if you listen to the Abbey Road box set, they have the um, the isolated strings that George Martin scored, which are very understated. You don't think about it all that much. But you put all this stuff together and you have this most incredible recording there. Um, and just compositionally, 
lyrically and melodically, it's a fantastic song. You know, there's a reason why there's so many cover versions of something. It's such a great love song. That's all there is to it. Um, and then I wanted to put Because in there. I think it's a very unique song because of the whole bit about, you know, you learn that it was um, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata played backwards or as, you know, John and Yoko have said um, that, uh, that John was influenced by hearing Yoko play Moonlight Sonata. And then the harmonies on Because or among the most amazing the Beatles ever did enough so that they isolated just the harmonies and released it that way on the Beatles anthology, incredible harmonies, incredible melody. You know, it's, it's really difficult here. I could just as easily have put, I want you see so heavy in there. You talk about a great rocker with, you know, jamming and it goes on and on and on and everybody contributes so much to it. I want you she's so heavy is one of those songs like Darren said, crank it to 11 it's just so amazing mm -hmm. but you know think about come together come together is now it has been for a long time the number one most played beatles song on classic rock radio really I, yeah you've said that that's right you've, you've pointed that out before that's interesting you know and i sometimes wonder why and I, there's no reason why i would say it shouldn't be there's so many great beatles songs but for some reason that one gets singled out and there's a real edge to it even though it's a slower song i think the slower it is makes it even more powerful that was paul's idea to slow the song down but um come on here comes the sun like you said you never give me your money there's so much going on on that record you're doing uh, like the whole album ken <laughs> yeah i'll just say golden slumbers medley something and because with golden slumbers being number one my least favorite but if you don't count her majesty probably Maxwell Silverhammer, which I lo still love. And I still would lobby for it to have been a single in 1969. I think it could have worked as a single. Um, yeah, it's a very clever song. Paul's vocals, everything, the whole arrangement behind it. I love it. So there you go. Well, what throws that over the top is Matt Levin's playing the anvil. Yes. Yeah. That could be the reason why it should have been a single, because of Matt Levin's. Think what he brought to it. <laughs> um, so now we've got the last album that they released, not recorded though, which is Let It Be. And we'll start with um Darren this time. All right, this one was hard because I want to do least favorite first. Uh and I and my least favorite was Across the Universe, which is a brilliant song. But it actually technically doesn't belong on Let It Be. Uh, and that's why I found myself keep thinking about that as the one that I would say my least favorite on Let It Be. Let It Be is one of those weird albums. It's another album that some people will kind of brush aside as being, you know, a fragmented album and not the Beatles at their best. And then, uh, you know, when you take a look at the heavy hitting, the songs that are the heavyweights on the album, they're amongst the Beatles greatest songs. Um, and, and, and it's like, you can't kind of just, you know, brush out and let it be aside. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Don't, don't acknowledge dig it or my, uh, Maggie may as being full songs, but they, they just add, they're like flavoring to the, to the whole thing, but across the universe doesn't belong there. Um, and it's funny how I always heard, let it be with, across the universe in there uh and thought gee why you know that i guess yeah that kind of sticks out a little bit um so that's my least favorite only because it doesn't belong there it's not part of that that period mm -hmm. um my favorite to contradict some of my picks for least favorite earlier on my favorites let it be um it it was a hit when I was a kid, and I realized I loved the Beatles. It was that and the Long and Winding Road, all over the radio, and I had the singles when they were brand new. and And um, to me, Let It Be is just it's like a hymn, you know. And and it's when it comes on that piano introduction, you know, takes me back to when I was five, hearing it for the first time, 
and that again that reverence that you know and the album version george's solo on the album version i've always loved it sort of is a little jarring that album solo doesn't maybe doesn't quite belong there but it belongs there and i love it <laughs> and my final my picks my closing to the show let it be my favorite across the universe the least favorite on let it be okay alan yeah so for my favorites um <clears throat> it's sort of a almost a tie probably between get back and i've got a feeling like them both are both sort of good rockers but i think let get back has the edge for me um possibly it has to do with you know having listened to the bootlegs all these years and hearing it come together you know bit by bit as they're writing it but and then seeing in the peter jackson film actually seeing all of that you know mm -hmm. happen just sort of watching this song from nothing become get back um but even without that i mean it's just got a, a great sort of rollicking feel uh, i remember when it came out it came out in the spring and it had it just it just seemed like a great springtime song um so get back is is it for me for my pick for the favorite on on let it be and i have a, a tie on least favorite too which are Long and Winding Road, and Across the Universe. Across the Universe is one of my favorite John Lennon songs. I love every other version of Across the Universe, the ones on Let It Be Naked, the one on Anthology, um, the wildlife version. Um, Phil Spector made this brilliant song into a pig's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate what he did with it. And that's not too strong a word. Um, I'm writing that down. A pig's dinner. Got to remember that. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, Long and Winding Road, kind of the same thing. But interesting thing about that. You know, I liked Long and Winding Road when, you know, the bootleg came out before Let It Be came out. Or at least it was broadcast on the radio before Let It Be, long before Let It Be. And so I got used to hearing it plain the way they played it in the studio and I liked that. And when I heard the gooey strings, I hated it. Now, interesting thing happened. Um, we just got uh, Mark Lewison's 41 pages of notes on this book. Um, and in the book, we talk about Paul's response to hearing Long and Winding Road and writing uh, um, line a note saying nobody should be allowed to touch my stuff and i hate this and blah blah, blah. well it turns out um i think he said that john eastman told him that that was really just political that paul didn't really dislike it and in fact and mark also cited a radio show where paul was on uh and they were playing uh you know they were playing various tracks that he was discussing and the DJ it was in, in Britain. I can't remember what show it was uh, said, you know, so long and winding road, but surely not the Phil Spector one. And Paul said, no, yeah, the Phil Spector one. I love it. <laughs> so, so this sort of changes, you know, our view of, um, you know, did he like it? Did he dislike it? Was it just political that he was complaining you know, was this just a was it was it just something he was using in the battle with Alan Klein or did he really dislike it? And the fact that the arrangements that he uses of it in concert are mm. not that different than than the um, Phil Spector one, uh, uh, you know, is is kind of telling. But I still hate that arrangement. To me, it's just way too gooey. I like the plain one and i like the one he does with winds i think on uh, broad street i think he uses wings uh, winds <laughs> uh, there. <laughs> a sax yeah part on the broad street version 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, and in fact, I guess on uh, Wings Over America. There's brass. Yeah, it's he just has a brass quartet. And it's, and it's a really beautiful arrangement by Tony Dorsey, the trombonist. And it, it's, it's really kind of Baroque. Um, that one may, I may like the best, actually. Just don't like the one on the Let It Be album. But um, in deference to Paul for saying he actually likes it, I'm going to go with Across the Universe because that's one of my favorite songs and Phil Spector destroyed it. Can I just ask you, you said that you got 40 pages of Mark Lewison's what exactly? <laughs> Comments and notes about, you know, having he's finally gotten through the book it's taken him a while because he's writing his own book it's hard to read a book when you're writing um and so he sent 41 pages of notes comments in response to your book yeah okay interesting you know, some of them are typos you know and some of them are just comments like that about long and winding road because because we get into that and he wanted to point out that actually Paul didn't necessarily hate it as much as he said at the time. Hmm. So. so. All right. Little tidbit that, you know, should be news to many of our listeners. Hmm. My choices are completely different from yours, Alan. My favorites are the long and winding road and across the universe. <laughs> really? Hmm. You know, I've I've defended Phil Spector so many times here on this show. I think that what he did add to the few songs that he did on the album, it wasn't the entire album. He added touches to Long and Winding Road, Across the Universe, I Mean Mine, and Let It Be. Um, I don't think it was really overboard. It's just, I'm used to it. I grew up on this version. I think if you have a great song, you can't destroy it. And in this particular case, when you've got a great melody, great lyrics, great sentiment, you know, I don't see how how Phil Spector did any damage to it. I love the whole string arrangement. I love the harp on it. I love everything about it. The brass when they when they come in with the four notes, da, 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 added a lot to the point where when I do hear it, when it's just the band. It needs something else. You got to spice it up a little bit. I don't think it would have been the hit record that it was. If it was the Let It Be Naked version. Mm. You know, I really don't. But um, no, I love what Phil Spector did to The Long and Winding Road. And I love the song, which is the most important thing. And I love the same thing with Across the Universe. You know, it's a, but I, I will admit that I love all those stripped down versions of Across the Universe. You know, the anthology one, Let It Be Naked. Those are just, it, the song just by itself is just exquisite. So as songs go, and, you know, I like everything on the Let It Be album, but um, those would be my favorites. And then um, not counting Maggie May and not counting Dig It, my least favorite would be Dig a Pony. You know, Dig a Pony just, um, you know, it's got the guitar lines in it, which are cool. The lyrics are really awkward. You know, uh, I think if Paul wrote the same kind of lyrics, people would be attacking him for them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the song kind of meanders a bit. I don't think it's one of John's greatest moments, but, uh, you know, I'd rather have it than not have it. You know, it's one of my least favorite Beatles songs, Dig a Pony. You know, or is it I dig a pony? It's dig a pony. I in some places. Somebody poked the eye out once. So those are our choices. Right. What are you folks watching or listening? Think of our choices. You think they were the best ones? The most suitable ones? The ones you agree with? Or do you think that we're way off? <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. What's that? Leave your choices in the comments. Yeah. We'd love to know what your choices are, your favorites, and your least favorites. And like Darren said, and we've said many times, we do this a year from now. Could totally. have different choices. Such is the case of having a catalog that's this powerful. All right. So before we go, let's go around the horn here and tell everybody what we're doing. 
and if they want to get in touch with any one of us individually. Darren, we'll start with you. All right. Uh, two two Facebook pages I have. Um, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of uh, what's going on, but I'm at, at the moment in, in Facebook purgatory, which has stopped me from progressing with the new things we said today, uh, Facebook page, mm-hmm. um, because I got into a little bit of a skirmish uh, over baseball. Um, so uh, you could try to find me on Facebook right now and shoot me a friend request at Darren DeVivo or come over to Darren DeVivo, uh, the radio page. Uh, either way, fi- you'll find me. I'll find you. We'll eventually be in contact with each other. Uh, as for WFUV, you want to tune in. If you're in the New York City metro area, we're at 90.7 FM. Um, anywhere else on the globe, you could listen to WFUV.org or on the WFUV app. And you could catch me Monday through Thursday nights starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. and Saturday afternoons uh, 1 to 4. So um, there you have it. That's me. Okay. Short and sweet. Um, we'll Thanks. save Alex for last because he'll give us all the information about our show. Um, as for me, you can always get in touch with me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Every Little Thing is the name of my radio show that I've been doing on the Beatles since 1982, and it's heard on over 50 radio stations. And if you want to hear the show, the easiest way you can do so is to go to WFDU's website. That's Fairly Dickinson University's uh, website in New Jersey. Um, and they've been running my show Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. And then they leave on their website um, archival shows, two weeks worth. It stays there for two weeks. And um, actually, very soon, they're going to be changing the time slot for the show. I'll let you folks know about that very soon. But if you want to listen to Every Little Thing on Demand, go to wfdu.fm and go to their archival shows, type in every little thing. There'll be two shows to pick from and you'll be hearing the last two shows that they aired at the radio station. Mm -hmm. Um, Also my um, other podcast show, talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show where we were comparing John Lennon's rock and roll album with uh, Paul's show Bobby CCCP both albums of 50s and early 60s rockers and even some pre-rock songs too like don't get around much anymore um so we're comparing those two albums and that was the last show that we did we're kind of taking a break for probably a month um so we'll be back uh sometime probably in early september and um I do believe that's everything. Oh, no, there's my own channel, Ken Michaels Radio, where I just did an interview with Chachi LaPrette. And Chachi has been a fixture in Boston radio since the mid 80s, where he's been doing Beatles radio programs. He has one called Breakfast with the Beatles. And uh, all the information about Chachi is in um, the description box for that show. Chachi LaPrette, the most recent Uh, interview that i've done he's interviewed three of the four beatles all except john he's interviewed yoko cynthia pete best george martin you know in one of the biggest markets in the country and he'll talk about his whole history doing the show and the state of beatles today what he thinks about all that's going on in the news and now and then and all of that um and i do believe that's everything Okay. Oh, <laughs> I forgot my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one of 10 great prizes, including the McCartney legacy, which Alan is displaying right behind himself. So that's everything. Okay. Um, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, or there is a McCartney legacy Facebook page. There is a uh, uh, you can write to the three of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, find us on YouTube for, for the video version. Find us on Podbean uh, for the audio version, which Podbean also sends out to iHeartRadio and Apple and, and you name it. We're all over the place. And um, we have a Twitter 
feed, which is at things we said fab. And um, yeah, that's um, that's about it. Okay. I want to make mention of something that I forgot to say in our uh, newscast. And that is that if you follow what's going on in the news, there's a lot of podcast shows out there on the Beatles and people that have YouTube shows. And they're all talking about the latest news almost to the minute, you know, whether it concerns now and then the red and the blue collections coming out. There's a lot of rumors that you hear. And rather than just telling you all what we've heard of what possibly can happen, we don't really know for sure. Sometimes we get inside information from people that do have accurate information. Sometimes we get inside information and it doesn't pan out at all. Rather than hit you all with what we've heard, all that I can say is that I am hearing that in the next week or two, there should be some major announcement, Beatle-wise and possibly solo uh, Beatles music coming out. So hopefully we'll be finding out something very soon. Could be right after we post this show. <laughs> but uh, we'll talk about it in our next show coming up uh, probably in a few weeks from now. All right. So thanks to all of you for uh, listening to us go on for a couple of hours, rambling on about our favorite and least favorite Beatles songs from each Beatle album. And like we said, let us know your picks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks to all of you for watching and tuning in. And for Alan and for Darren, I'm Ken Michaels and saying thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.